How many people here have been in a glider accident? And uh, probably everybody here knows somebody that's been in a glider accident, right? Um, how many people here have been involved in the aftermath of an accident? What we do is dangerous. We've oftentimes heard the phrase repeated, gliding is safer than driving to the airport. And that's not only wrong, it's dangerously wrong. In 45 years of flying now, I've lost 25 friends to accidents and gliding, and I've never lost one driving to the airport. Hopefully some of the stuff we're gonna to cover today will, will help make gliding a bit less dangerous. Uh, we certainly learned a few lessons that would have made this a little less of an ordeal or a little less likely to have a bad outcome. Now that we've picked the camera back up off the floor, we're gonna introduce ourselves. My name's Dave Nadler, I was the pilot in command. I've got something over 4,500 hours of gliders in the camera and I that is in uh, motor gliders. Uh, most of that time is flying high performance gliders cross country, uh, primarily in contests. And in the last 90 days prior to the accident, 92 hours, Marcus Scanlon had uh, 312 hours. <coughs> so the previous time I flew the Arcus at E5 was the 26 open glass nationals. And the last day I was sixth place at 104 miles an hour, just in back up east in the JS-21 frequency. In front of me, it's actually pissed him off. Um, and so by most measures, uh, one would probably think I'm reasonably proficient in the aircraft and reasonably current in the aircraft. Uh, the previous flight I had in the Marcus prior to coming to um, E5 was at the uh, Perry contest. And, uh, I won the last day in the open class about three miles faster than uh, Dick Butler in 40. So again, the point of that is that uh, by most measures I was reasonably proficient in the aircraft and current. Hi everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm Spencer Chantelon. Uh, I'm a senior at the Air Force Academy. I'm planning to graduate this May. My sophomore year at the Academy, uh, I was lucky enough to be picked up as an instructor pilot for the 94th Flying Training Squadron. Uh, our job there is to expose first-time flyers to myself, uh, to the world of aviation, uh, to hopefully get them to be pilots. From there, uh, I was blessed enough to be picked up as one of the 10 members for the Seven Lake Racing Team. Um, our job is to go out and compete against the likes of young guys and girls, um, places like Nephi, Truckee, uh, air sailing, uh, great places. Um, and I've, I've gained so much experience from that. Um, but as you can see, I don't have that much experience, about 100 hours um, prior to this flight with Dave. Um, I've never been in the Arcus, um, but I did have some experience uh, doing this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the aircraft. The Marcus M and the Duo have a pretty good safety record. Um, very few Marcus M have been uh, destroyed or uh, <coughs> never had an incident where the aircraft was an issue. Um, the glider itself was uh, is a pretty easy to fly glider. It's a little bit difficult to fly really well, but it's it's not a very difficult. I mean, it's extremely tolerant of pilot doing uh, odd old things. So, you know, I was raising money for the junior team, and people were donating money to the junior team and flying with me in the back seat. So, I let them fly, and I saw a number of unusual attitudes from <laughs> letting people fly the thing. And, um, it really did have any vices in the same flight. And it was a pretty easy plane to fly, and I, it, had, it has a very good. Field. In fact, one of my first flights in this uh, in the Marcus Sam, a friend of mine let me fly his. We did a, I think I flew a 500 k on the Seminole with a 3,000 foot ceiling. And on a day that everybody thought it wasn't pliable, and in fact, we got Varios because the Varios were so horrible, I turned them off. So it's, a, it's not a difficult thing to fly, it's an easy plan to feel what's going on around the entrance. The predecessors of this aircraft have not had such a I couldn't find any loss of control problems with 3D, but I did, I, I, I got to note that the original one especially had a lot of problems with the original vertical tail. Um, Al Lepler's plane, they saw the tail off 
replaced it with a labor lease, replaced it with a kind of gear and everything back. It's replaced the original roof and tail and some tendency to, uh, you can stall the pit and it took a lot, a lot of force to get back to center. And we thought, of course, it was doing nothing it's installed. So that, that was uh, something that was addressed at the gym. See on the newer gliders, a much, much higher aspect ratio for a fin, smaller control surface. It's much more efficient, and it's much more effective. So you'll see a whole the newer gliders. This is, this is difficult, but the old ones had these issues. Um, the 4D has had rather more checkered history. Um, 100 build, 5 miles of control, and light brake ups, which is pretty scary. It's not 
not jets, the older gliders and the jets can be quite dangerous when they all because they can hit you. So like Roy Cunnings being allowed to hit him hard enough to break his jaw. It's a good thing it didn't there because it hit my rubber and knocked him out and survived. So the last thing I remember um, is Dave Young and me getting off the controls. Um, I actually didn't hear the bailout call, um, but by the time the can became open, you get the idea. <laughs> 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 it was, we just thought a problem. Um, so yeah, so we began the, the egress procedure, uh, everything that we always practice, taking off the full point harness, uh, getting out from the can. For some reason, whether it be nerves or the situation, uh, the full-point harness just wasn't coming out. Um, it just felt like an eternity as we were going towards the ground, uh, just trying to get that full-point harness out. But finally, it did come out, um, and I started to get out from the, the camera. One thing that I didn't think of uh, during the bailout sequence was because of the attitude and the speed that we were going towards the ground, um, there's actually a lot of force from the wind pushing you inside the, the canopy. Um, so I was pretty surprised when I was trying to get out and uh, I felt like I was stuck. So finally, just put both hands on the sides of the rails, put my feet on the seat, and just push as hard as I could. Um, thankfully, I wasn't struck by any part of the plane. I'm very fortunate for that. But one thing also that I didn't think of was because of the way that I uh, came out from the, the cockpit, um, I started tumbling immediately. My, uh, my roommate at the time was uh, doing the jump program at the academy, and he told me all these things about stabilizing in the air, uh, <coughs> just a classic Mission Impossible, uh, arching your back as hard as possible. So I, I tried that. I didn't wait for stabilization. Uh, I pulled the T-ring. Thankfully, everything opened. The opening shot was fine. Um, and once again, very blessed uh, to be to be in a good condition under camp. I was wearing prescription glasses at the time, so they flew off uh, during the bailout. Um, so I was pretty disoriented, trying to look around, uh, get a feel for my surroundings. Um, and I tried to look for, for Dave uh, in the air. I thought I saw a flash of orange, much lower than me, and to the south of me. Uh, but I really couldn't tell, uh, because my eyesight was pretty bad at the time. I tried to fly over there, uh, tried to head towards that orange. But because of the winds were being so strong, I had that altitude. And because the way that uh, the location that we ejected was right over a valley with a bunch of trees at the bottom, and it looked like I was going to land right there, I decided not to do that. Um, so I made the executive decision, uh, turned downwind, uh, trying to find the best spot on the mountain that I could I could see with my eyesight. Um, and it looked good until about five seconds of impact. Um, didn't realize it was the bare face of the cliff. So, <laughs> but, uh, but we'll get to that. So, um, I had a, a little bit of difficulty. So the first thing was I had some trouble getting my hand on the round drop release. So, despite having done this a million times, I had trouble getting my hand physically on the release and turning it. Got it there, turned the release. And unfortunately, the next thing I saw was the sky with my hands and feet above me as I fell backwards towards the ground. Now, I had this brief flash through my head about this business that some of us had been taught in our parachute training to stabilize the fall. And I immediately realized that was an incredibly stupid idea. I pulled immediately. So that is, um, that's an important thing. Um, some of you have had the training to say try to stabilize the fall. Don't do it. If you're not an experienced jumper, you're not going to be able to do it anyway. You're going to waste a lot of time, you're going to pick up speed, don't do it, just pull. Um, I got the chute open less than one second before I hit the, would have hit the ground at about 150 to 200 feet. So I didn't really have a lot of time to sort out landing options, but I was going to <laughs> yeah. I was going crosswind and the terrain, I'll show you some pictures very, very, very difficult. So I knew I had to get into the wind, turned, grabbed the turned into the wind, and I was landing right here on 
found a spot between Joshua trees or whatever those things are, boulders, and had the presence of mind the training 35 years ago to get my feet together and knees bent. I did stupidly try to flare. Don't do that with the brown shoe, um, but it didn't make much difference. Anyway, I impacted extremely hard, and I didn't have the opportunity to fall and take some of the energy the way that we were taught because I was between obstacles and also had no speed because I turned into the wind. So the, uh, the impact was pretty severe. It came down the base of my spine. That's where I broke the vertebrae. The other injuries, the broken ribs, the bump on my head, the black and blue on my face were probably from hitting the plane on the way down, which is probably why I got knocked down. So uh, a few lessons learned. Um, this was in a strong 26-foot emergency chute, and um, thanks again to strong rivers. Um, one of the issues we have with these things is that they're very high descent rate to begin with, and there's a reason for that, which we'll talk about in a second. But the density altitude here was about 11,000 feet when we hit it. So if you correct the sink rate for your weight and the density, the atmospheric density is the square root of the ratio of weights, square root of the ratio of density, um, and figure it out. Um, instead of having like 7.5 per second or 12 miles an hour vertical, I had 20.6 or 14 miles per hour vertical, as best I can calculate. So we know you have that kind of guy. Figure this stuff out. Anyway, that's 40% more energy than sea level uh, with that shoe. Unfortunately, the shoe radius is 200 pounds on the way. So that, that, uh, that helps. Um, a lot of chatter about the round shoe versus square shoe. So a square shoe um, is normally used for an emergency shoe, reserve shoe for uh, sport jumping. They have a player them, they have better LRD, they have a lot of advantages, but they are very sensitive to opening in the correct time. And they take longer to open, more likely to foul. the chances of being able to get into the correct attitude quickly are really poor. Cool. And experts I talk to uniformly said if I had a square shoe as we were, I would be dead. So I would recommend don't do that. The round shoes have a higher rate of descent, but they are much more reliable and much faster at the point. Um, I'm going to use a static line going forward because if you do get knocked out, um, you know, it's real, real close uh, come to before it hit. And there's certainly been a number of accidents where that looks like it and what happened. The pilot got knocked out and never, never pulled. Um, this is a very inexpensive thing. You're ready to install it and uh, clip it to the uh, orange wing and some older gliders uh, for this reason. Um, it is possible that you shoot the static line battle on a piece of the aircraft going out, but I think the odds are better with the satellite, so I'm using that in the future. Another thing is that um, the g loads in this incident were extremely hot. Spence told you he had trouble getting out. I don't know how he got out. Um, if you take the wings off, the g load is going to go down. So the wings, the outer wings broke off the same instant I just can't be. And the wings were found about a mile away from the rest of the wreckage. So that may have helped. But, uh, one of the things to consider is if you have a situation where you can't get out and the spoiler's out because it knocks the, the uh, G, uh, G's that'll take the break the wing uh, down considerably. Uh, so when you both will see the max G's are going to be reduced from the standards of regulations. So the occasion appears 5.3 G's down to the half. So that might have helped. I pulled the spoilers out and have an easier time getting out. Uh, one of the nasty things that happened is as, as after my impact, I reached up to grab my tracker, and it wasn't there. It was very discouraging. Uh, you, I had a pouch on the shoe with belt drum closure. Now, it may have not hit in the bouncing off the fuselage, and I don't know, it may have popped out when I deployed the shoe, because I deployed the shoe. It's 125 like, terminal velocity, and 
situation was 520 miles an hour, and true air speed in this case, 140 miles an hour. So the open shot was pretty severe, and that may have been what broke my ribs. Um, the uh, <coughs> tractor must be clipped on. I see a lot of people clipping it on the shoulder. There's no chance that that will be there after the jump. <laughs> Zero chance. So it needs to be the couch, proper closure, sewn to the harness. Not up here with a clip. Um, some more lessons there. First, if you're interested in training, we recommend absolute ones. At the Air Force Academy, before we send anybody up to be a crew on any plane, uh, we always make sure that they have the proper uh, parachute training. Uh, things like uh, how do you harness, how do you egress, how to pull the D-ring and how to land safely. Just basic stuff like that can really, or probably did, save my life. Don't delay after first initial disbelief. Most just like a, like a car crash, there are always those few seconds where you think, this can't be happening, this is not my day, things like that. Those few seconds, should we be in a worse situation, might have made a difference that day. So I think the best way to kind of prepare for that is to make sure that you're you're thinking about these situations. Uh, of course, nobody thinks that today is going to be the worst day. Nobody ever plans for that. But situations like these, you need to make sure that you know exactly what you're doing, how you're going to do it, and what you're going to do. Speaking of preparing, a uh, pre-flight brief. Um, I know that Dave and I, uh, before we flew the Argus, um, we had a pre-flight brief and went over things such as the bailout. Um, sometimes it kind of sounds like we kind of just go through motions but with that stuff, but stuff information on that, that brief uh, saved my life. Um, one thing that Dave taught me uh, in the pre-flight brief is um, the location of the oxygen bottles over both of my shoulders. He said, um, in case that we have to bail out those, those oxygen bottles, uh, might get snagged in the parachute, so just be wary of that. Sure enough, when I was pushing clear, something was stuck in my shoulders, and I, I thought to myself, uh, those dang oxygen bottles. So, Stuff like that is very important, especially if you're flying with crews that aren't used to aviation. <clears throat> Things like that can really, can really save the trip. <clears throat> Necessities on your body. Um, like I said, I was wearing prescription glasses at the time, and unfortunately they were in the cockpit of the plane. Um, so I didn't have it for uh, my, my egress and my, my search and rescue portion. Uh, my phone was also under my leg. Maybe you don't think that they'll stay on your body, but when I landed, I had some tissues and my pack of gum still in my pocket. Things like that might stay on your body, so try to keep that with you instead of with the plane. Dress the egress, knowing your environment. When we jumped out, it was summertime and we were dressed adequately for the summer, but I know many times in the winter when it's snowing, I still wear shorts and short sleeves because it's more comfortable. What if it what if it wasn't summertime? What if it was the winter? Um, and you're waiting, you know, hours for the rest of them to show up. Stuff like that can can make a difference. Parachute pre-flight and knowing your equipment. Regulations require us to repack our parachutes every 180 days and to pre-flight the parachute before every flight. It can get tedious, but because of the way that Dave takes care of his equipment and the amount of detail that he takes into everything that he does, but once again, this is the reason why we're both still here. And finally, uh, a life support kit. Uh, Dave and I, among other sources, have been uh, talking back and forth about you know, what a life support kit could look like. We haven't come up with a definitive answer yet, um, but we do know what it does look like. Stuff like Velcro, things that will come off when you're coming towards the earth at 120, 140 miles an hour. We're thinking about things that we can put in, you know, maybe knives, fire starters. Life straw, stuff like that. We haven't come up with um, flight proof stuff yet, um, especially on the Air Force side, but we're definitely working on that. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so everybody see where Spence landed? See the shoot? It's not so easy to see, is it? No. Uh -huh. We don't think about that, but it's a real problem. So, you know, use a tracker and make sure it's properly attached to your harness.
doesn't show is that um, these are rock slides. Right? So the, the terrain is very, very rough. Loose rocks to get the end of the nose. And um, not, uh, not fun. So Spence landed on the side of that thing. Here's a closer look. Not, not generally considered an ideal location. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I promised it looked better uh, as I was heading towards it, but as you can see, <laughs> it probably wasn't the best decision. Um, so yeah, so um, I chose the best location. Uh, it looked like the bare face at the time, uh, but I realized it actually was further than the bare face. So I prepared just like it taught me how to land. Feed these together, these bad. Um, I try the flare, um, but as we find out with the round shoot, it doesn't work. So just try to protect myself as much as possible, but hit the mountain pretty hard. Um, thankfully, didn't get knocked out or hit my head or anything. And the parachute actually got stuck to the top of the rock. Um, so I was kind of hanging there, my feet were interlocked in the rocks below, uh, so I, I didn't fall, thankfully. Um, and I was able to get my parachute stuff off and start to make my way down the mountain. I knew before we jumped out, we were close to Richfield. We were, uh, Richfield was to our in the northwest. Uh, we had about 4,000 feet final glide from our altitude. Um, as I was making my way down the mountain, uh, I had a lot of time to think, uh, so I was trying to do the math in my head. Uh, you think about you know, 4,000 feet final glide, uh, 20 to 1 glide ratio, uh, maybe 6,000 feet to a mile, uh, came out to be around 13 to, to 15 miles away. And I knew that the sun set towards the west, so I started walking uh, towards that way. Um, thinking about 20 minutes, probably walking towards a mile, it's probably going to get there around nighttime. Uh, since the time I hit the mountain was about uh, 3.30, uh, 3.32, I think exactly. Um, so I started working my way uh, down the mountain. I knew I saw that flash of orange uh, towards the south of me, who I thought was, was Dave. Um, so as soon as I got down, maybe halfway down the mountain, I looked at the sun, looked at the situation, and I thought, I can allot one hour to look for Dave. I thought maybe I had a chance, I knew where he landed, and I just wanted to do my best to try to find Dave. But because of the situation I was in, I was pretty much blind at the point, you know, the sun was setting, I figured, you know, maybe an hour was enough just to look, and after that, I could probably find people who were, who were more capable. Unfortunately, I made my way, as you guys saw the valley, I made my way towards uh, the other side, uh, towards the south. Um, hour passed, nothing. So I started making my way down the mountain again and trying to find some help. Fortunately, um, as you can see, I'm, I'm saying fortunately a lot. There was a lot of things that, that went right there. Um, it was an ATV trail, uh, so I started making my way down that. It was much better than uh, the rocks and everything else. Actually, this morning I, I heard a rumor um, that I like to dispel. Um, I, some of you guys have heard that I, I carried some rocks with me. Um, I, I picked it up with me. Uh, that's actually true. So I, I did grab some rocks for souvenirs for my for my mom. So she has some. <laughs> 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 yes, that was the first time to say that. Um, and so yeah, uh, I came to a road at the bottom of the mountain. I uh, started heading towards Ridgefield. I actually found a sign towards a nearby town of Annabella, about five miles away. So I started to hike towards that way. Met the, the greatest people in my life um, three hours later on the side of the road of Shingaz. Um, thankfully, they had some water and a phone. So I, I called 911, um, told them the situation. Um, thankfully, the people uh, had some time. They took me back to the, to the crash site. Um, and I met the sheriff's department. Um, Really nice medical personnel, Civil Air Patrol, uh, just, just great people who are, who are willing uh, to fight the cause for us. Uh, spent about an hour and a half on the ground uh, trying to look for Dave. We thought he was close to me. Uh, it turns out, as we find out later, um, he was in the valley of Oakland, um, so we couldn't see that at the time. So thankfully, uh, they could send out the helicopter. It was probably around 7.30 uh, to 8 at the time. Um, they still had some daylight to send out the helicopter because we crashed some sources, uh, thankfully. And finally, because of that helicopter search rescue, they found Dave uh, on the side of the mountain, and they got him out. Um, four lessons learned. Uh, noticing your environment and marking it. I thought when I was coming down the mountain, I would always remember that mountain. But sure enough, four hours later, 
as I came back with the sheriff, but all the mountains looked the same. Um, thankfully, as I was coming down the mountain, I, I saw some markers from the campsite. Um, so I kind of made myself a little arrow pointing to where I came from, and I, I found it with the sheriff, so I knew this was the mountain. Uh, so stuff like that can come important in the, uh, the search and rescue process. Keeping track of time. Uh, 20 minutes to a mile walking, roughly, maybe 30 minutes if you're coming down the mile. Uh, stuff like that can help you know how far you are. So thankfully I was keeping track of the miles and I was walking. Um, I could tell uh, the, the people who picked me up on the side of the road exactly how far we were. Um, also helped uh, the sheriff come kind of find out where exactly we were. With, uh, with the sense of approaching and stuff, it's, it's very important to keep track of, you know, what are you going to do, what are we staying, you know, ahead of the plane. 30 minutes from helicopter watch the sunset. Once again, very lucky uh, that we had we had such a, an abundant amount of sunlight. The helicopter launched immediately as soon as it could. And thankfully, we found we found Dave. And this is what I took from the safety shop um, at the academy, uh, writing down everything about the incident. Um, as soon as I was in a stable position and I was heading back towards uh, my team, um, they gave me a, a notepad, a pencil. Write down everything that you can remember uh, about the incident. Uh, stuff like that uh, tends to be forgotten. Uh, important information about you know, where you landed, names, scenery, anything that you notice can be forgotten, especially when the adrenaline comes to Things like that are very important in the NTSB investigation when the checkers told me, uh, stuff like that. Never, ever, ever work in the 
especially in the modern gliders, you have carbon fuselage, so the antenna has to be located remotely. Any kind of impact will break the antenna <coughs> connection. It doesn't matter if the DLT itself works. There's no antenna and there's no signal going out. So a tracker properly secured to your parachute is a really good idea. Um, again, no need environment. And uh, expensive rate goes down the SAP. They got them down to <coughs> at dusk. And uh, I won't bore you with all the details of the helicopter trying to get to me in that canyon. Uh, but it was uh, it was very, very lucky that it was the longest day of the year. I was out there, I think, well after sunset when, they, uh, when we actually departed the mountain. But the helicopter couldn't land anywhere there. So they found a rock outcropping place down. And the guy jumped out of the helicopter down into the rock outcropping, made his way to me, helped me get back there. The helicopter had to go fly off some fuel because it was too heavy to hover at that density altitude with three people came back and hovered with the edge of the rotor blade. It was, I tell you, it was a bit threatening to look at where the rotor blade was. The was. <coughs> and the other guy, I grabbed onto the skin of the helicopter, and the other guy grabbed on the belt and gave me a big key ho and I pulled as hard as I could and got into the floor of the helicopter. And he made us, he, he made us a big grab. Um, so what happens next? go through the procedure and fill out the FAA adjustment stuff. But the NTSB priorities are first and foremost, and anybody get killed, excuse me, I didn't. And uh, is it a common aircraft? Obviously, if there's a problem with an aircraft in which there are a huge number flying and people get killed, they're a lot more interesting. So as a taxpayer, I'm delighted that they have this priority system, but as the guy that wants to find out what the hell happened, it was a little discouraging. The insurance company priorities are spend as little money as possible. <laughs> and the recovery procedure in instances like this, you will often have some guy show up with an ATV and a 4x4 trailer, and maybe a chainsaw, and maybe a sawzall, and maybe a bolt cutter, and whatever can fit that trailer. So you can imagine the condition of things, even if you had enough information to start with. It's not you know, one quick window with uh, it's, it's not, not so good. The initial recovery of the aircraft was completely fumbled, so I didn't find out for quite a while. I had been told, oh, we got it. Well, no, not exactly. They recovered the wings and not the fuselage. Let's not bring that full. Um, so I talked to the NTSB and I said, look, it's not a time priority. Nothing's going to happen. We have no budget. The only way that record is going to get recovered is if you locate it, provide the coordinates and photograph to the insurance company, then they're going to be obligated to retrieve it by whoever's the landowner is going to tell them to get it out. So I didn't find out that this initial recovery was above for quite a while. So I, when this happened, uh, when I got this from the NTSB, I came very honest with them. I said, okay, well, this is on me to figure out what happened, where it is. So finding the wreck was talk about this days of all the nonsense that went on. But um, first and foremost, there are a lot of people around who help with this. I'm not going to read the names, but thank you very much. Um, research for Google Earth. I did make a point of while I was lying there for six hours memorizing a funny looking rock formation so I'd be able to see it in the future. And it turned out it was very helpful. Um, I tried to find something to drill to overfly and failed. Called up some guys, flight friends of mine, and asked if they could overfly, which they did. Also called up a local CAP, gave them some information about where to look, and they were uh, extremely helpful. But thank you, thank you for those guys. Um, once the wreck was located, another one of my friends, again, thank you, hiked up there, took photographs. And it's a good thing because otherwise we really would have had a problem. And then this was given to the insurance company. It went out a second time. And at this point, it's almost three months after the accident. And there are storms going through. And so, and also souvenir hunters. Stuff is going missing. Finding the wreck was a bit difficult. So the last tracker position was over here. I figured it probably came down kind of vertical, but that was kind of stupid. In retrospect, 
I should have realized that it was going to be very close to where I came in, because I, you know, I came out in a vertical or a vertical or somehow in the second. Um, so I kind of guessed it would be over here in line, or maybe I should have been spent a bit more. The wings were somewhere back here. So when the wings come off, they, 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 drip, they, they don't fall so around. But my guess was completely incorrect. Anyway, the CAP found it. So this is a photograph of the CAP that we found. Did everybody see it? No. Yeah. 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 No, that white spot down there, that's actually a reflection of the candle. Oh. Uh, it's not red. Anyway, so again, the point is it's not so easy. Um, this is a close-up. So a few more lessons learned. First of all, protect the rep. Now this is something which a lot of people have had problems with, but you've got to get the flight recorders out of the rep immediately. If it's a small flight recorder, it's going to walk. If it's anything else, there may be weather going in, they're going to trash this. Get it out of the rep. Now, a lot of times it's like, no, no, you mustn't touch the rep. Well, remember, it's in the FARs, preserve the wreckage. So if anybody says, no, you can't touch that, you say, according to the FDRs, we must preserve the records. The most important part of this investigation is the flight logs. We've got to get that stuff out of here right now. Photograph the wreck, and not just the wreck, but the surrounding area. So is there any scarring in the trees that show what, what happened? And understand, again, that it's going to be removed in a very, very destructive so here's the Ford fuselage. We'll go again. We'll figure out what happened. <laughs> the tail cone, you know, the thing is pretty much vertical. So the tail cone, the, the front of the fuselage took a lot of the energy. The tail cone pieces were more, uh, more intact, but you can see not so intact. And then we had the first smoking gun, which I was convinced for some period of time. That's the upper rudder hinge. Spar fin is like this, the rudder hinge is pinned like this, and it was bent over 90 degrees. So, the only thing I could thought, think of that could have caused this was maybe you know, some kind of failure. Of it was nothing but the bottom mechanism because it's extremely, it's extremely beefy, uh, and it was also quite, quite intact. The, the, the bottom rudder hinge structure and everything was all, all there. <coughs> um, anyway, this was a bit of a wild goose chase because um, if we had the good photographs of the area, we would have seen the tree scar. It was not going to work. My buddy would hike up there, got chased off the mountain by a thunderstorm, so we got some pictures and then you have to leave right now for lightning strikes nearby. But again, the, you know, now we've got the record number after providing this information, but it's not a high NTSB priority. And then we have the fatal accident, the duo. A lot of similarities in the same basic fuselage design. This is Janus, Nimbus, Ceres, and Duo, and Artemis um, share common parts like that the top order culture. So I called up the NTSB and I said, Now listen, we really have to find out what happened here. It may have something to do with this other guys. So at that point, they started to get a little bit serious. Unfortunately, the next thing that happened was the longest number of shutdown in history. So it took quite a while, but eventually we had the uh, investigation in uh, February of 2019. NTSB composite with the structures experts and Chris uh, uh, Bonner from, uh, from Chef Berth. And they assembled as best they could all the pieces that they found in the hangar. They determined that it was the upper hinge failure was caused by the impact. The rudder hit a tree on the way in. That's, they could tell it wasn't. That's not what caused the accident. So that was a bit of a weapons chase. And after all this work, you know, I know. So um, one of the things there is um, speculation is kind of unhelpful. I guess I'm probably guilty of this going on this goose chase on the rudder hinge. But um, it's very difficult to find out what happened in some instances and uh, a lot of crazy.
based on speculation because no one would do. So first and foremost, again, a lot, a lot of people have helped. Because a lot of people have gone to the ground going like 
this probably on the main lift web because they didn't look at the handle. So you should have your handle wrapped in alternating red and white or red and yellow tape. And you look at the rip cord handle and you don't pull the rip cord, you push it. You grab it with your right hand because it's going to be over here on your left. You get your other hand on it if both of your arms are operable and you push it towards your ankles. Now when you are in this <coughs> position, not in your nice arch and spread, one of the advantages of that is you will find yourself on your side and instead of running the risk of having a nice burble on your back, which could capture your pilot chute, which we see in skydiving or used to, you're going to have that relative wind going right across your back, grab your pilot chute, and you will get a faster opening. So anyway, just to recap, get good ground training on how to use the chute. Because that training I had 35 years ago was the difference between flying a boat splat and they didn't go. What about um, taking a practice skydiving? Um, I, you know, it, I, people used to ask me, why, you know, if you've ever jumped, they say you wear a chute. I said, no. And they said, well, listen, listen, if I ever have to use a parachute, I'm going to be very happy if I have a couple broken bones or whatever. <coughs> Compared to the alternative, I don't really need to be an expert. I need to know how to get out and get the thing deployed safe. So I did the ground school. I would urge all of you, please, if you haven't already done that, do the ground school. Learn how to land correctly, how to handle over correctly, practice all that stuff in the ground school. But I, this is my first and hopefully last parachute jump. So. <laughs> I'm uh, upgrading shortly to the, the ESP app on my discus, and uh, Arian has a uh, global satellite service that can track that. Um, I think this would be an excellent alternative for search and rescue, and it's actually one of the main reasons I'm adding it. Would you comment? Um, so okay, the um, ADSB out is helpful for search and rescue because we have now, uh, it's not global coverage, but it's pretty thorough coverage of the area on system on satellites picking up ADSB. Whether it will track it accurately or not, not entirely clear. But there, we're, we're running a kind of a peculiar uh, system. We don't run by person, like airliners do. And the antennas are located on the bottom for a very good reason, which is to make sure that the ground stations can receive one. That doesn't really count the satellites. So if you have an antenna on the bottom where it's meant to be for air traffic, you may have a of bits and pieces blocking it, and it may not be tracked by the aerial system. So it should be tracked, hopefully, by ATC, but where you are and what altitude you're at. Um, I think that it could be very, very helpful. Florin can also be helpful, you know, we've that's, that's also useful in uh, search just getting the form tracks from other gliders in the area. And uh, that can be there's some compressed records that periodically keep track of other aircraft in the vicinity and that can be extracted. So you're flying with anybody in the vicinity. In our case we were by ourselves last to launch a P5, struggled to get out of there. So uh, we, were, uh, we were probably blessed to be a smart solution. So because of you know the launch situation, the EMOS, if you're flying a few things, you can be in the back. We need to review the, the search and rescue procedures for FLARM, yep. make it readily available, and same with this new satellite for ADS. I, I think the best thing you can do is use the carbon in reach. That's what I'm, I just bought another one. Pay the extra money for one minute updates and have it properly attached to the parachute because that's the best odds of getting a message out. Right now, I need help. Here's the GPS location. I'm sorry.
courts in the Don Clough, Hot Clough, and the Risers, and not in the Kevin Barnes. If you were in a parish, should you be? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Bill. Where in a parish, should you be hooked up to that gold, gold ring all the time? The static line? That, the, that strap you were showing in there. The static line, yeah. Get a little lighter, you hook up the static line. The trick is to remember to unhook it before you leave out of the lighter. <laughs>